In all care settings, preventing and controlling infection is vital to protect the people you care for, the safety of visitors, your colleagues and your own health. Some groups of people, including the very young, the old and those with long-term conditions or who are immunocompromised, are particularly susceptible to infections and less able to fight them. For them, any infection at all can be very serious and even life-threatening. It's crucial that as a provider of care, you have the knowledge and skills to help prevent risk of infection and provide a safe, clean and healthy environment. This short induction programme introduces you to the 10 Standard Infection Control Precautions. NHS Scotland has produced a National Infection Prevention and Control Manual outlining the minimum standards that should be carried out at all times. These are called the Standard Infection Control Precautions and are often referred to as SIPs. They are 1. Hand hygiene, cleaning your hands properly and regularly. 2. Personal protective equipment. By this we mean disposable gloves and aprons and occasionally eye and or face protection and fluid repellent masks. 3. Respiratory and cough hygiene explains the simple steps to take to prevent passing on a cold or other illnesses. 4. Safe management of blood and body fluid spillages. This includes cleaning up spillages such as urine and vomit. 5. Occupational exposure management. This is about protecting yourself from needles, scratches and splashes of body fluids such as blood. 6. Safe management of the care environment, which includes the cleaning of furniture and fittings. 7. Safe management of care equipment. This is the cleaning and maintenance of equipment such as wheelchairs, commodes or hoists. 8. Patient placement for those you care for, which relates to the continuous assessment of infection risk and occasional need to temporarily separate an individual who has an infection from others to prevent it spreading. 9. Safe management of linen. This is about safely managing clean, used and infectious linen, such as bedding. 10. Safe management of waste, including sharps. The correct management of waste, which can be anything from soiled bed pads to household waste. Carrying out hand hygiene properly and frequently is the single most effective way of preventing the spread of infection. Think of all the things you do every day using your hands, like scratching your nose or touching your hair. Your hands are covered in microorganisms, even when you think they're clean. These microorganisms can spread to anything or anyone you touch. The most effective way to clean your hands whilst at work is to use alcohol-based hand rubs. However, liquid soap and warm running water are best if your hands are visibly soiled or you've been caring for someone with a suspected or known gastrointestinal infection such as norovirus and Clostridium difficile. By protecting your own health, you'll help to protect others too. Intact skin is a major barrier against developing infections, so check your hands for any cuts or abrasions and cover any broken skin with a clean, waterproof plaster. Nails should be kept short and free from nail varnish and nail extensions. Jewellery should be kept to a minimum and no stoned rings should be worn, but a plain band is permitted. You should also bare your arms to the elbow and remove watches and bracelets. It is important to use the correct technique when undertaking hand hygiene. The following procedure describes the steps you should take to clean your hands properly with an alcohol-based hand rub. 1. Apply a palmful of alcohol-based hand rub from a dispenser into a cupped hand and cover all surfaces. 2. Rub your hands together palm to palm. 3. Rub the back of each hand with the palm of the other hand and interlace your fingers. 4. Rub palm to palm with fingers interlaced. 5. Rub the back of your fingers to the opposing palm with fingers interlocked. 6. Rub each thumb in turn, holding it in the opposite hand using a rotational movement. 7. Rub the tips of your fingers in the opposite palm in a circular motion. 8. Allow your hands to dry naturally. Don't use paper towels. 
Alcohol-based hand rubs and gels must not be used when hands are visibly soiled and dirty, when dealing with someone with diarrhoea and or vomiting, after any contact with blood or body fluids, during any outbreaks of norovirus or other diarrheal illness. In those cases, hands must be washed using a liquid soap and warm running water. When using liquid soap and warm running water, the following procedure applies. 1. Wet your hands with warm running water using a mixer tap if possible. 2. Apply liquid soap from a dispenser and cover all of your hands to create a lather. 3. Rub your hands palm to palm. 4. Rub the back of each hand with the palm of the other hand and interlace your fingers. 5. Rub palm to palm with fingers interlaced. 6. Rub the back of your fingers to the opposing palm with fingers interlocked. 7. Rub each thumb in turn, holding it in the opposite hand using a rotational movement. 8. Rub the tips of your fingers in the opposite palm in a circular motion. 9. Rinse your hands with running water. 10. Turn off any taps. If you have long-handled taps, use your wrists, but if not, use a paper towel. 11. Dry your hands thoroughly with paper towels. You may need to carry out hand hygiene a number of times throughout your working day. Here are some examples of when you may need to wash your hands. On arrival at your place of employment before work begins. Before and after helping someone with a meal. After you go or have helped someone else to go to the toilet. When you have come in contact with blood and or body fluids, for example urine or vomit. Before eating, handling or preparing food. When you have taken off disposable gloves and before you leave to go home. The World Health Organization have defined the key moments for hand hygiene. You may see this poster in healthcare premises or in your organization. You should also encourage others around you to follow good hand hygiene too. It is recognized that washing hands frequently can result in irritation to the hands. It is therefore important to manage any skin problems and in the right way. The NHS Education for Scotland Hand Dermatitis booklet provides information in this area. Activity 1. Pause now and think of five occasions where you may need to carry out hand hygiene, then record your thoughts on the activity sheet. Personal protective equipment, often referred to as PPE, is available in your day-to-day -day work to help protect the people you care for, you and your colleagues from the transfer of infections. It is a legal requirement of health and safety legislation. The most common types of personal protective equipment are disposable plastic aprons and disposable gloves. Occasionally you may need to wear face protection too, such as masks and visors. Personal protective equipment should be used when there is a risk of hands or clothing becoming contaminated with body fluids, such as vomit or blood, or when you need to clean an area or a piece of equipment. Throughout your day, you will also need to assess each task you undertake and ask yourself if you need to use PPE. Gloves come in a variety of sizes and should be close-fitting. They should also be changed for each person you're caring for and each new task. Don't carry gloves in your pocket and never wash them or apply alcohol-based rubs to them. Regardless of the task you've been doing, you should always assume that your gloves and apron have become contaminated and must be removed with care to avoid cross-contamination. Gloves should be removed first, followed by the apron, then eye protection and lastly a mask if worn. To remove your gloves, you should grasp the outside of the glove with the opposite gloved hand and peel off. Hold the removed glove in the gloved hand. Slide the fingers of the ungloved hand under the remaining glove at the wrist. 
peel the second glove off over the first glove. Then ensure correct disposal in the correct bin. To remove your apron, firstly, unfasten or break the ties at the neck, letting the top half of the apron fall. Then unfasten or break the ties at your waist. Fold or roll the apron into a bundle, ensuring you do not touch the front of it. Finally, ensure its safe disposal in the correct bin. Face protection is needed when there is a risk of blood or body fluids and other contaminating substances splashing onto your face. To remove goggles or a face shield, handle only the headband or side. If disposable, ensure its safe disposal in the correct bin. If reusable, place it into a designated receptacle prior to decontamination. To remove a mask, unfasten the ties, first at the bottom and then the top. Pull away from the face without touching the front of the mask. If disposable, ensure its safe disposal in the correct bin. If reusable, place into a designated receptacle prior to decontamination. You should always carry out hand hygiene after removing PPE. Activity 2. Pause now and think of five occasions when you will need to wear personal protective equipment. You may also wish to find out where it's stored at your workplace. Don't forget to record your thoughts on the activity sheet. There are many diseases that can be spread through coughing and sneezing, the most common ones, such as cold and flu, can be spread rapidly, especially in environments where people live and work in close proximity. It can also occur at any time of the year, not just during winter months. There are a few simple steps that you and those you care for can take to reduce the chances of becoming sick or passing colds and illness on to others. Always use disposable tissues to catch sneezes and cover coughs. Then put the used tissue immediately in the bin and carry out hand hygiene with liquid soap and warm running water. Hankies that require washing or laundering are not ideal. Instead, you should try to provide paper tissues and encourage the people you care for to follow good respiratory hygiene. Flu immunisation for those who are eligible should also be encouraged. Activity 3 Pause now and note how you might encourage someone to carry out respiratory and cough hygiene, clean their hands after blowing their nose or sneezing. Then record your thoughts on the activity sheet. By spillages, we mean blood, body fluids such as urine, vomit, faeces and sputum. Any spillage must be dealt with immediately to avoid potential exposure to infection and to prevent accidents. Before undertaking any procedure, staff should assess any likely exposure and ensure that PPE worn provides adequate protection. When dealing with spillages, you should always put on a disposable plastic apron and gloves. You may also need to put on a mask and eye protection if there may be a risk of splashing. For spillage of urine, vomit or faeces, place paper towels onto the spill to soak up the excess liquid. Remove the spillage with the paper towels, then disinfect the area with 1,000 parts per million of available chlorine or use a combined detergent chlorine releasing solution with a concentration of 1,000 parts per million of available chlorine before cleaning the area with hot water and detergent. Never use chlorine-based cleaning products directly on a urine spill. For blood spillage, a kit may be available to help you, but you should always read and follow the manufacturer's instructions and check the expiry date of the solutions. If there is no kit available, you will be required to collect your PPE equipment and disinfectant of choice prior to decontaminating the spill. Within healthcare settings, chlorine-based agents are used to decontaminate blood spillage and other body fluid spillage with blood. This may be similar to your place of work. You must check your local policy for cleaning of blood and body fluid spillage, including the type of cleaning agent or disinfectant to use, and follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. Also, ensure adequate ventilation when using the disinfectants. Here is an example on how to decontaminate blood spillage using a chlorine-based disinfectant. The same principles of your choice of PPE and safety measures apply when using disinfectants, but follow the manufacturer's instructions. Put on aprons and gloves. 
If using granules, cover the spillage with granules and leave for the time recommended by the manufacturer before cleaning up with disposable paper towels and or a scoop if required and available. If using chlorine solution, 10,000 parts per million, cover the spillage with disposable paper towels and gently soak the paper towels with the solution. Leave for three minutes or as per the manufacturer's guidelines. Then dispose of the materials in the designated waste bag. Wash the area with general purpose detergent and warm water and paper towels, then rinse and dry it. Discard the disposables into the waste bag, which should then be disposed of into the appropriate bin. Remove PPE and dispose of it in the correct bin. Carry out hand hygiene. Never use chlorine-based products directly on a urine spill. If the spillage is on a carpet or soft furnishings and is heavily decontaminated, you may have to discard. If the furnishing can withstand a chlorine-releasing solution, then follow the appropriate procedure for the type of spill. Alternatively, if it is safe to clean with detergent alone, follow your local procedures. If not safe to clean with detergent, the item should be discarded. All items used to clean up the spillage, including any remaining contaminated disposable cloths or kitchen roll, should be discarded in the correct waste bag. Activity 4. Pause now to briefly record what equipment you'll need for dealing with spillages of blood and or body fluids. Then record your findings on the activity sheet. This precaution is about protecting you from potentially harmful items or substances, including sharps and spillages, such as urine or blood. From time to time you may be exposed to sharps, such as needles, broken glass, razors or anything that may break the skin. This is called a sharps injury. Should an injury occur, make the wound bleed gently under warm running water, wash with liquid soap, dry with a paper towel, then cover with a waterproof dressing and report the incident immediately. You should also ensure that the sharp is disposed of correctly. The same procedure is followed if you have a bite that breaks the skin or blood splashes on an uncovered cut or abrasion. Splashes from body fluids must also be dealt with immediately. PPE should be changed straight away and splashes to the eyes or mouth should be rinsed with copious amounts of water. You should follow local policies when reporting accidents and incidents. Vaccination is another way of reducing your risk of acquiring certain infections, such as influenza and hepatitis B. You should speak to your employer or occupational health department if appropriate to obtain further details regarding this. Activity 5 Pause now and briefly record your local policy for reporting accidents and incidents. Record your findings on the activity sheet. When using the word environment, we mean all furniture and fittings, such as surfaces, floors, doors, blinds, showers and toilets. Dust and dirt can allow microorganisms to multiply and spread. Effective cleaning is an essential step in preventing and controlling the spread of infection, and a cluttered and untidy environment can prevent this taking place. This aspect of infection prevention and control can be difficult to achieve in an individual's own home. You do, however, have the potential to influence them to make changes in their environment, which can be helpful for everyone. If you work in a setting such as a care home or community-based unit, the cleanliness of the environment is everyone's responsibility. An environment that is clutter-free and clean inspires confidence for those who live, visit and work there. Activity 6. Record whether your setting has a cleaning schedule and who is responsible to ensure it is completed and kept up to date. Record your findings on the activity sheet. Delivery of care involves many different items of care equipment. Care equipment can generally be categorised in the following ways. Single-use equipment is used once on a single person and then discarded. It must never be reused, even on the same person. 
Equipment that falls into this category includes dressing packs or syringes. Packages will be identified with a single use symbol, a two with a line going through it, which means you cannot use it twice. Single patient use equipment such as a hoist sling can be reused on the same person. Reusable non-invasive equipment, often referred to as communal equipment, includes items such as mattresses, bed frames, wheelchairs and walking frames. Keeping reusable items clean, fit for purpose and well maintained is everyone's responsibility in order to prevent the spread of infection. Most items of equipment will have a specific cleaning procedure and an agreed schedule for its frequency, which you should find out about. Some items, such as hoistlings, are for use with a named person and no other individuals. These slings are usually laundered. Always ensure you follow the manufacturer's instructions. Commodes are used in care environments. The contents of commode pots are disposed of according to local policy and they must be thoroughly cleaned after each use. Activity 7. Pause now and find out about the local policy for A. Cleaning care equipment and B. Maintaining care equipment and record your findings. If the person you're caring for displays the signs or symptoms of infection, such as high temperature, a rash, diarrhoea or vomiting, it is important that you inform the person in charge. This is because it may be necessary to isolate the person from the rest of the community or household to care for them in a room of their own. This can be a frightening or frustrating experience and staff should work closely with family, friends and carers to ensure that everybody understands the importance of protecting the well-being of everyone else. Always remember that infections can spread rapidly, so it's important that you report any signs of infection to your manager as soon as possible and ensure the entire team adhere to all of the standard infection control precautions. Activity 8 Pause now and think about how an individual may feel if they are separated from others and what you might be able to do to reduce any anxieties that they may have. Record your thoughts on the activity sheet. The safe management of linen means dealing with the risks of cross-contamination of clean, used and infectious items such as bed sheets, towels and duvets, as well as personal items such as clothing. Used linen can harbour microorganisms and these can be transferred through handling, so it's important to understand the process for managing linen and laundry within your setting. You should wear an apron and gloves when the linen is contaminated with blood or body fluids. Such linen is referred to as infectious linen. First, remove the used linen by rolling or folding the linen into a bundle. If there is faeces or vomit present, this should be picked up using a paper towel and disposed of. Used linen should not be put on the floor, shaken, soaked or rinsed. It should instead be placed as a bundle in the correct laundry bag. There will be separate laundry bags for used linen and infectious linen. The laundry bag should be close to hand so you don't have to walk down a corridor with it. You should remove your gloves and apron and carry out hand hygiene before handling the clean linen and completing the task. The same principles of hygiene apply for personal clothing and other laundry items. Activity 9. Pause now and find out about the system for managing linen and laundry within your setting. Record your findings on the activity sheet. By waste, we mean everything from household waste to incontinence pads. The safe management of all waste by those involved in the handling, transporting and processing of it is an essential part of health and safety and general good hygiene. Your setting may use different coloured bags to manage this waste appropriately. Some waste will be recyclable, such as broken crockery, cardboard and paper. Other waste, like household waste, can be disposed of through the routine domestic waste systems. However, other waste may need to be segregated as hazardous or special waste. This will need to be placed in the correct coloured waste bags. 
always should be binned as soon as possible and bags should not be over full, only three quarters full. When handling waste soiled with body fluids, you should always wear disposable gloves and an apron and place it in the correctly coloured waste bag. Activity 10. Pause now and record the arrangement for the safe segregation and disposal of infected waste and sharps. Record your findings on the activity sheet. This programme has given you an insight into the 10 standard infection control precautions. By following the guidance, being aware of local systems and procedures and taking responsibility, you'll help to prevent infections and the spread of illness when providing care.